Okay, thank you for that, Catherine. It's a great song this morning. Take your Bible, please. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. Use this as a starting point this morning, and then we'll look at the end of this chapter for our text. First Peter chapter one. Are we all okay back there? All right, before we get started, let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll uh, dive into our text this morning. Our Father, we thank you for just a good day so far here in church. We thank you for our time in Sunday school as we were able to uh, hear from your word and learn some truths that can impact our lives. And I pray this morning that as we open up your word again, that your word would work its way in our heart. Pray, Lord, that as we share uh, these truths, that we'll be open and receptive to what you have for us. I pray, Father, that what needs to be said uh, would be said, and what needs to be left out would be left out. And I'd ask that you would take uh, your word and make it powerful, and make it evident in our lives today. Thank you for what we'll see this morning. Thank you for the promise that you give us. Help us to act upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, we're gonna, going to look at a couple of verses here just to set the stage, but uh, you probably are familiar with this particular book. Uh, Peter is writing to really a, a group of believers, Christians, who are scattered uh, throughout the area, scattered throughout the, the region. And at this particular time, uh, these particular people are really under the gun, if you will, with a lot of trials a lot of troubles, in fact, even a, a, a lot of persecution. Uh, this is a time period when the Roman Empire was in play, and it just wasn't a great time uh, in that area for believers, for Christians uh, at, at all. And so many of these people were under the gun, if you will, suffering, uh, having many trials, many struggles, many difficulties. And so Peter writes this letter, in a sense, as a way to strengthen them, as a way to encourage them to live victoriously in spite of the difficulties that they were faced with, in spite of the persecutions, and really in spite of the burdens that, that they carried. And one of the things that you'll see is he starts out this particular letter uh, down in verse number 3. We're going to read a few verses, but he starts out by just telling them, giving them a picture of what the future looks like. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, let's read uh, verse 3, 4, and 5. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So he starts out this letter obviously cognizant, aware of the challenges that these people are in the middle of and starts out by just reminding them about the future. And I think it's always good for us. Uh, certainly any time we come into church, is uh, it's resurrection day, is that we, we, we kind of look toward the future. We understand that no matter what we may be going through at this particular moment, uh, what lies ahead of us is a whole lot better than what the present is and certainly a whole lot better than the past. And so here, Peter, in these first three verses, he tells them what the future looks like. You know, our future is secure. If you're here this morning, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your future is secure. Uh, he says we have a living hope. It's living because our Savior is living. Uh, we have a resurrected Savior. So we have a, a living hope because of that. And he goes on to say we have a very sure inheritance, not something we have to wonder about. So he starts this letter by telling these people, hey, listen, the future is really good. What's lying ahead of you is just going to be a wonderful thing. And then he gets to verse 6. In verse number 6 he says, wherein you greatly rejoice. Rejoice in the future. Though now for a season... If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. 
And here Peter recognizes that while the future is bright and the future is secure and the future is lively and, and we know that what we have in heaven because of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, even though there's a future, I realize right now that there are trials. I realize that there are struggles. I realize that there are difficulties, there are challenges. And, 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 and as you and I sit here this morning, I think the message would resonate simply as well that our future is secure our future is bright. Our future is in a lively, living Savior. And yet, right now, for many of you, there's challenges. There's struggles. There's difficulties. There's, there's testings. Um, and, and one of the things that Peter says, and if you'll note again in verse number 5, he says that it's A, just for a season. And you know what? Seasons can be long, all right? I was just in Minnesota not uh, too long ago in January, and I think they had been in winter since last January. Um, seasons can be really long, or they can be really short, but the good thing about a season, it does leave. It does change. Uh, so Peter says it's in a season, but you'll notice he says it's in heaviness. In other words, the difficulties that you and I are in the middle of can be very heavy, very challenging, very, very, very hard for us as we go through life. And then he drops down to verse 8. He says this, Whom having not seen, ye love, speaking of Jesus Christ, in whom, though now ye see him not, notice this, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here's what he does. He says, first of all, your future is secure. Right now, there's some challenges and struggles and difficulties and, and hard things that you're faced with. And then he says, I want to encourage you that during these manifold testings, during these times of very heaviness and challenges and frustrations, make sure that during these times you keep your focus on Jesus Christ. And that's what he says there in verse number, verse number 8. You haven't seen him. Uh, you, you, you have not seen him. You, you don't see him, but you believe. You stay focused on him, and you keep, you keep your eyes on him. You lean on Jesus. And as you do that, notice what happens. He increases their joy. They have joy unspeakable and full of glory. So Peter begins this letter with this understanding that the future is great, the present, their challenges. And in the midst of the presence, what he tells these people is, you lean on Jesus. You lean on Jesus. Now, how does he end the book? And we want to get to our text. So go to chapter 5. Go to chapter 5. With this as background, let's look at our text. Now, as you read through chapter 5, you'll find just a tremendous amount of truths uh, inside each of these particular verses. But in, in, inside chapter, chapter 5, we know that we have a future in heaven. We know that we have struggles on this earth. How is it that we're supposed to live day by day in the midst of that? And he tells us in chapter 5, verse number 6 and 7, which will be our text this morning. Peter says this, he wraps up the letter. He says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know, no doubt this morning, again, that there are many here, many of us here in the midst of some type of struggle, some challenge. And that struggle could be a physical struggle. It could be a spiritual battle. It could be an emotional uh, conflict that we're in the middle of. Uh, and my question that I want us to consider this morning, the question that I want us to take out of this passage that we'll preach on is this. Are we carrying or are we casting our burdens, our cares on the Lord? And I think it's a question well worth us analyzing. So to somewhat illustrate this, and every time I get these crazy ideas in my head, I wonder if I should do it or not. But um, anyways, to illustrate this, I brought my backpack with me today. And this is the backpack that I generally take with me to work. In fact, uh, Eric Weatherington encouraged me to buy this type of backpack, and it's been it's great advice, good backpack. And I normally have my computer in here and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but I took that out today, and I added some special items. Now, what I would tell you is that the backpack right now is a lot heavier than normal. 
okay? Uh, normally, I would not carry this around. And if I had to carry this on my back every day, all day, I would be one worn out guy, okay? And so this is a heavy backpack. Now, some of you, when you came in the door this morning, I'm wondering how heavy your backpack was. What are you carrying? What are you carrying? Now, you're curious, I know. You want to know what's in the backpack. Okay. So some of you may have walked in this morning, and uh, maybe you're carrying with you some health cares, some health concerns, some health burdens, some health challenges. Maybe you came in and uh, I'll run out of room and you can't read, but I'll tell you, maybe you have some discouragement. Maybe there's something that happened this week that you thought was going to take place and it didn't, and you're discouraged. Maybe there's a prayer that you've been asking God to, to answer and he's telling you to wait and you're discouraged. Maybe this morning you have a relationship burden. Maybe there's a child. Maybe there's a uh, spouse. Maybe there's a family member that for whatever reason it's a burden. Somebody's not living for the Lord that was living for the Lord. Somebody's not doing what you would expect them to do and it's creating conflict and that conflict is a care is a burden that, that, that you're carrying it could be that you have some financial concerns this morning maybe the job that you thought you were going to get didn't happen maybe the income tax refund you expected didn't show up okay but there's some financial concerns, or frankly, it could be that you're just plain worried. Plain worried. Now, if I had enough bricks, we could line the auditorium. Right? We could line the auditorium. And the question that I pose to you and the question that I pose to me is simply this. What are we carrying? Are we carrying or are we casting? And I wonder how often we carry these types of things and many, many others uh, day in and day out, these anxieties that we face, and we're physically worn out, we're spiritually beat down, we're emotionally in turmoil. And I will tell you, my friends, it does not have to be that way at all because Jesus says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7, He says, cast your care all not part, all, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, I'll stop here and just say this. If you're not a saved this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, what I am going to speak on is not available to you. You have to know Jesus as your Savior. First step is relieving the guilt that you're carrying, the sin that you're carrying, and going to Christ and repenting and asking for forgiveness of those sins because what he's promising, what Peter is preaching to these people are Christians. These are people that have access to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the power of the Holy Spirit. And these burdens are lifted because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. I have access to him. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, much of what we'll talk about may won't apply you have to start there. So I'd encourage you, if you're carrying the guilt of sin and burden and, and, and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that before we leave today, get that settled. Silly, silly to go out the door carrying that stuff. Just get it settled. But just as equally silly as that is, it's just as silly for us as believers who know Jesus Christ to carry this stuff around too. Okay? He gives us a way to have peace in the midst of that. So Peter tells us to cast. So, cast is the word that is used to describe throwing something onto something. Okay? So, cast is a word that we would use to get this picture that I am going to take my cares, my anxieties, my worries, and I'm going to throw them onto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the idea of casting. And he says to cast our cares Cares, broad term. Cares are the anxieties that we face. The worry, 
that we are involved with, the pain that is part of our life, the discouragement, the burdens of life, the things that are pulling us in different directions. The problem with putting up little bricks is you can't put up enough to name every burden that everybody's carrying, but understand what the Lord Jesus Christ says is you should take those things those cares, those anxieties, those worries, that thing that kept you up last night, that thing that hit your brain the first thing you woke up this morning, how is this going to work out? I don't know what's going to happen. Take that and cast onto the Lord Jesus Christ because He cares for you. So in our time that we have left, I have four questions that I want us to answer. The first question is this, what keeps us from casting? What is it that keeps us from casting? We'll find it in our passage. The second question is, why should we cast? Why should we cast? Third question, how do we cast? That one will be quick. And then the fourth question is, what are the results of casting? What are the results of casting? So let's spend a little time, let's dissect these questions. Question number one, what keeps us from casting? And you'll find the answer here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, and in fact, if you'll go back and, and we'll, we'll kind of go up a pass, go up a verse. Look at verse number 5. And Peter, who's been giving examples here or, or, or uh, admonitions to other leaders, he says in chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 5, he says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So what keeps us from casting? Here's the answer, a lack of humility. Or shall we just say pride? That's the thing that keeps us from casting. You know, many times in these verses, the Scripture teaches the necessity of humility, not just in talking to leaders and how leaders ought to lead with humility, and it's talking about how followers ought to follow with humility, and it's talking about how equals ought to equally be humble one uh, toward another. And, 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 and so for those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, casting our care upon Him is actually an action that reveals our humility. Okay, I'll say it again because it's important to understand. It's a, a casting is an act that we take. It's an action that we take that demonstrates our humility. When I fail to cast my care upon Him. In essence, I'm saying, I have this. I've got this. I can do this on my own. I can, by sheer discipline and willpower, move this thing down the court. And too often we allow our pride to prevent us from casting. Our confidence in our ability to handle Whatever the issue is, whether it's a physical issue, whether it's a spiritual challenge, whether it's a financial challenge. I don't know if you're like me, the first time I have an issue, a burden, something comes up, my little brain goes into solve mode. How am I going to fix this? And, uh, you know, that's just nothing but prideful. Really, that's all it is. Now, that doesn't mean God's not going to expect me to do something. Don't misunderstand me. But too often it's how can I do that rather than, okay, Lord, how are you going to work through me? to do this. It's a totally different attitude. And what Peter is telling these people, he says, listen, you're in the midst of some trials and struggles and challenges and difficulties and your tendency is to figure out how am I going to get out of this? No. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. And so we allow our confidence to, to handle the cares to keep us from handing them over to God. And I would say this, I, maybe I'm getting too personal here, but I think sometimes we see our cares as badges of honor that we wear, that we wear, so other people will pity us. And, and what I would say is just be real careful about that. Uh, the, the care that God has placed upon my life is the care that He's placed there for develop something in me that I'm lacking. And my reaction ought to be not let me look at all the hey look at all the burdens that I have. And if we're not careful, we're actually using those as a prideful way to draw attention to ourselves 
rather than wanting to glorify God. And so we want to be careful with that. And what, what I see in this passage is that humility, a lack of humility, pride keeps us from casting. Now, there's another phrase in here that I think is very important. You'll notice in verse number five, uh, 6, he, he, after he tells us to humble ourselves, he says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. Now, time won't allow us to fully kind of uh, d- spread out what that, dissect what that phrase means. But it, it's a, an Old Testament reference that you'll see uh, often uh, centering on God's, shall I say, God's covering over Israel. In fact, the phrase has more to do with God's sovereignty than it has to do with anything else. And often we'll see it's God's mighty hand, mighty hand of God as a hand of deliverance. But what you and I may have learned in our life is that oftentimes in the midst of our difficulties and struggles, there's not a deliverance until whatever is supposed to happen has happened. Until the lesson is learned, there's not a deliverance. But you'll know, and we could go around this room, in the midst of those trials, God's hand has not been removed. His hand is still covering us. His hand is still over us. And one of the things that I think we could take from this phrase of humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God is to recognize the idea that God's hand is always a hand of sovereignty. What does that mean? That means God's always in control. God's always in charge. Um, That means that the struggle, the trial that you are facing, catch this, is a God-controlled experience. So there's no point to fight it. God's already controlling it. He already orchestrates it. He's already placed that health issue, that financial issue, that spiritual struggle. He's placed that person that rubs you the wrong way. He's put that in your life. He's aware of it in your life. And understand that fighting it, arguing with God about it, is not going to do any good. What the scripture says, accept it. Humble yourself underneath the struggle, underneath the mighty hand of God, and simply cast your concern, your cares upon Him. So if you're having a financial challenge, you can fight that if you want to, but it won't make it any better. We've all done that. We all have stories where we fought against the test to fail and take it again, right? We tried to shortcut the test and got caught and had to take it again. And and what God is teaching and what Peter is telling these people is, listen, humble yourselves under my hand, my authority, what I know what's happening in your life. Do you think that these Christians who were being persecuted, that God had no knowledge of that in advance? Of course not. God was well aware of what was going to take place in their lives, and he was certainly strong and capable and sovereign enough to bring them out of that as well. It's no different for you and I. So God's in control. I was reading a commentary and one gentleman said this. I thought it was appropriate. He said, I used to think that God's gifts were on on shelves. Catch the image here. I used to think God's gifts were on shelves, one above the other. And the taller we grew in Christian character, the easier we could reach them. I now find that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other. It's not a question of growing taller, but of stooping lower, that we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. And the application there is humility. God, it says again in the passage, okay, God resisteth the proud. God resisteth the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And then at the end of verse 6, that in that he may exalt you in due time. 
Now, I, I wish it said something like that he may exalt you in John time. It doesn't do that. It, it exalts you in his time. And so here's the deal to learn from this. The persecutions, the trials, the struggles, the difficulties. Guys, they, they come. They come, they go. They're, they're not just going to disappear. And so what Peter is telling them and what the Scripture is telling us this morning is we don't have to carry all that stuff in our backpack. We don't have to carry those cares and those burdens. What we can do is we can cast them. Now catch this. It doesn't make the care go away. It just makes the backpack lighter. Okay? But why? Because I'm casting it on him and he's carrying it and me. Or we can choose to be prideful, carry it ourselves, continue living a defeated life. So what keeps us from casting? Pride. 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 If you're holding on to it, Probably some pride that needs to be dealt with. Second question, why should we cast? I like this. We won't spend much time here, but I love this, this concept. Why in the world should I cast? I mean, John, why shouldn't I carry? It's my burden. I ought to be able to carry it if I want to. Well, why should I cast this care? I tell you, it's real easy. It's right at the end of verse number 7. You should cast it. We should cast it. Why? Because he careth for us. That's why we should cast it. He cares about us. You know, I was thinking about that, and I, 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 I was a couple of things that, 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 that kind of came to my mind. Number one, um, casting indicates trust. Casting indicates trust. You're, you're not going to cast something onto someone or something if you don't think that someone or something can actually handle whatever it is you're casting. So there's a trust mechanism that takes place. And I thought about that. You know, as believers here this morning, we trust God. We, we trusted God for our eternal destiny. We trusted God for our soul to eternally be in heaven. Why in the world do we struggle with trusting Him day to day? It just doesn't make sense sometimes. I trust you, God, for my soul that when I leave this earth, I will spend eternity in heaven, but I'm going to hold on to this little health problem right now. Oh, my word. It just doesn't make sense. And again, it goes back to the very thing that started the problem all the way years and years ago, and it's pride. It's just pride. I can do it better than God can. I can handle it better than He can. And what the Scripture tells us here is we have to trust Him, and we, and we, we need to understand that he cares for us. So let, let me just, I'm going to read some verses real fast. You don't need to turn to them, but I just want to read some verses. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, everybody knows very well, but God commended his love toward us. He commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? Christ died for us. Guys, he cares for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a demonstration of care. There's a couple other verses. There's Luke chapter 12 is where I went. Verse 24 and verse 28. You guys are familiar with this. Scripture says, Jesus is teaching, Consider the ravens, for, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ, by Christ Jesus. And then one verse, if you're taking notes, you may want to write down and look at Psalm 55, verse 22. David says, Cast thy burden Upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. Well, you got to get the last part. And He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. That's a promise that you can count on. So, why do we cast? Because He cares for us. We could literally go through scripture after scripture demonstrating the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ cares 
for each one of us, individually, by person. It doesn't make any sense to carry that which I can cast when I have such a Savior who cares for me as He does. It just doesn't make sense. So what keeps us from casting? Pride. Why should I cast? Because He cares for me. And then how is it that I cast? How is it that I cast? Now I'm going to give you four things here real quick. And then we'll move to the next point and we'll see these four illustrated in different passages, okay? So there are four ways that we should cast. Again, Peter tells him to humble himself, cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. But how do we cast? How do we cast? I'm going to give you four real quickly. Number one, we pray. Number one, we pray. These are basic fundamentals of Christianity. Number one, we pray. Number two, we, we are saturated with this word. We cast by being saturated with His Word. Number three, how do we cast? We trust. You say, well, what does trust mean? That means I get up and I walk by faith. That's what trust means. I walk by faith. I believe that God is going to do what God said He was going to do. When I cast it on Him, I act accordingly. And number four, uh, I think we cast by singing, praising, and expressing gratitude. I lumped them all into one. Now I'm gonna, we're going to go to we're going to turn in our Bibles in a minute. We'll look at some different passages that demonstrate casting and demonstrate the results. But let me go through those again. How do you cast this morning? If you're sitting here and you have a financial burden, a physical burden, a a relationship care, you have some anxiety in this job or whatever it is. How do you cast? Number one, you humble yourself. Then you pray, and I mean not just a prayer. I mean we pray. You're going to see this. We get a hold of God, and we're casting, we're casting, we're casting that burden. And we find ourselves in the Scriptures, we're saturated with God's Word, and we allow that Word to change our mind. Number three, we trust. We get up and go. We walk by faith, believing He'll take care of it. And then finally, we have an attitude of singing, praising, and gratefulness. So let's see how this is demonstrated in Scripture. I have ten minutes and four passages, so here we go. Turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is All of these are very familiar to you, but I think they're just absolutely solid as we look at what are the results of casting. So we've looked at three questions so far. Number one, what keeps me from casting? Number two, why should I cast? Number three, how should I cast? And then number four, what are the results of casting? Here's the first result. It's found in 2, did I take you 2 Corinthians? I hope so. Chapter 12, you know the passage. The second, uh, the, the first result of casting is grace. Grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse number 9. In fact, let's back up to verse 8. You know this story. Uh, verse 7 tells us that Paul had this thorn in the flesh. I would say that the thorn in the flesh was a burden. I would think it's fair enough to call that a care, an anxiety. We don't, again, know what it is, and the reason for that is nice because we can apply uh, pretty much whatever burden I'm faced with today. You have a physical need, it's a thorn in the flesh. You have a financial concern, it's a thorn in the flesh. You have a wayward son, grandson, uh, spouse, there's challenges there, it's a, it's a thorn in the flesh. I mean, we, we all have a thorn in the flesh, and Paul had that thorn in the flesh. And you look at verse number 8, he said, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times Paul prayed. Three times Paul asked. Three times Paul, if I can say this, cast that care upon the Lord. And he asked specific, take it away. Can you make it leave? Can you make it go away and that it might depart from me? In verse number 9, And the Lord said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then notice Paul's response. Most gladly, therefore I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So in that particular passage, you have Paul praying, you have Paul trusting, and then you'll have Paul singing, praising, and expressing gratitude. Because what he in essence said there is, hey, I'm grateful for this thorn in the flesh because this thorn in the flesh gives me an opportunity to point to my Lord Jesus Christ and share that with other people. So one of the benefits that we get, one of the things that we get when we cast is that we get grace. 
it doesn't mean that the burden goes away. It just means he's carrying it for us. I don't have to care. Some of you are here this morning. You have a physical challenge you've had for 10, 15, 20 years. It didn't go away. It didn't disappear. Some of you have some relationship challenges that uh, there's nothing that you can do other than cast, and the Lord Jesus Christ gives you grace. We have grace. That's a benefit of casting. Grace. Grace is a benefit number one. Benefit number two is peace. Peace. Turn with me to Philippians. You know this very familiar passage. Philippians chapter 4. Come on, turn over there. Let's look at this. Philippians chapter 4. You're going to see these four things come into play again. Praying, saturated in God's word, trusting, singing, praising, and expressing gratitude. Very familiar passage. Philippians chapter 4. Verse number 6, what does Paul say? He says, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't get all wrapped up, consumed, worried about, anxious over stuff. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So cast, cast, cast your care upon Him. And notice what happens. Verse 7, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Boy, can you give testimony to that? The burdens that you've carried and you've cast and you get up and God has given you a peace and you say, I have no idea where that came. I just can't explain it. Well, that's divine. That's from God. That's the benefit from a Savior who cares for you. So he says here, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So here we have peace is a benefit of casting. So grace is a benefit of casting. Peace is a benefit of casting. Now here's another one. I'm going to turn you all the way over to Nehemiah. Love this passage. I've used this in our Sunday school several times. Just absolutely love the passage. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. I don't know why I told you to go to Nehemiah. In fact, I just had a brain lapse. You never had one of those, have you? Huh? That's called getting old. Yeah, I don't want to go to Nehemiah. Now I'm having a really brain lapse. I'm going to ask you in a minute to tell me where to go. I'd be better off if you went to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's close. It's in the Old Testament. That Nehemiah passage is a good one too. Uh, you know the story here. This is the story of Hannah. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll move quickly here. Look at verse number 10. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse number 10. Here's Hannah. You know Hannah, she, she, she was struggling. She, she didn't have a child. In verse number 10, it says she was in bitterness of soul. I'd say she had a burden. I'd say she had a care. She had an anxiety. She was in bitterness of soul, and what did she do? She prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You go down to verse 15. You note she was praying so much. Eli thought she was drunk. In verse 15, And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. If you drop down to verse 18, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight, so look at this, the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. Here's the third benefit of casting. You get a changed countenance. You get a changed countenance. See, God did something inside her soul that reflected on her face. 
She wasn't going around like Eeyore was hanging on her shoulder. Woe is me. I can't have a child. My life is... Instead, she went before the Lord. She cast her burden. She stayed there and cast her care upon God. And when she stood up to leave, her countenance was no more sad. Casting changes our countenance. Then finally, go to Psalm 13. It'll be my last passage. Psalm 13. We won't go through the whole psalm, just enough to whet your appetite. Psalm chapter 13. Another illustration of casting. This is David. So what are the benefits of casting? Number one, grace. Number two, peace. Number three, a changed countenance. Number four, a new perspective. Notice David in Psalm chapter 13, love this passage. He says in verse number one, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? So David, he's, boy, he's got some anxiety here. He feels like God's left him. He's in no relationship with God. Where are you, God? How long will you forget me? Like the omniscient God can forget. But David, we've all been there. Lord, where are you? Where are, where are you? And we get to that place and David is feeling badly about that and it's a, it's a burden on him. How long will you hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? If we had time, we'd dive into that, but that's the worst place to go for advice is inside. Don't go inside the soul for a solution. Part of David's problem is he kept asking himself what the problem was and his good old self kept confirming that God was evil, bad, and wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't care about him and it's just a perpetual thing. It never ends. And so he went to his soul, a horrible place to go. But David, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart daily. He had burdens. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Now look what happens in verse 3. He changes. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Consider and hear me. He grabs the weapon of prayer. He grabs the weapon of prayer. He says, lighten mine eyes. Show me truth. Show me the truth. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Now notice verse number 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy. David goes back in the past and recalls the days in which he trusted in God, and God proved himself faithful. I have trusted. My heart shall rejoice. That's a present tense. He makes a decision that today he will trust. And then notice what the new perspective is. Verse number 6, I will sing unto the Lord. Look at this, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Now follow the passage in verse 1, where are you? And in verse 6, my goodness, you're so good to me. You're so good to me. Listen, when we cast upon him, it changes our perspective. No matter what we may be faced with today, my guess is everybody in this room can look back and see he was faithful last week, last month, last year. And if he was faithful then, good night, he's going to be faithful today. And when we begin and we get a new perspective of just how good, just how good he is. So several years ago, my family and I took a trip to North Carolina, to the mountains. We enjoy going up there. And uh, this particular trip, we were looking for something to do as a family. And so we were flipping through, you know how you go to these places, you get these little coupon books and they s try to sell you a bunch of stuff. Um, but we saw there horseback riding. I don't like horses. But nonetheless, being a good obedient husband, um, we, we take the children, and this has just been a few years ago, and we, we go to the horseback place. Uh, and of course we pull up and you get to see the horses, and that's always fun. Uh, we spend some time with that. And these, this particular day, the, the lady said, you know what, we, we've had a change in plans, if it's okay. Uh, your horse today, is we're going to be riding through the, the river. I said, D -d 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 -d. you know, I thought we'd just kind of go around in a circle. But no, 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 we went down, big bank into a body of water, and, you know, you had to pick your legs up because it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. Um, <laughs> In fact, uh, Tracy's horse kept trying to bite mine. That's just how fun this thing got. Now, I, it's silly. We, we, we did. We had a great time. 
I, I think we've done that twice in my life, and I'm, I'm good. Um, but, you know, if, if you were going to ride a horse, if you were going to ride a horse, you would not get on the horse and then ask somebody to hand you the saddle. Wouldn't that just be dumb? Here I am sitting bareback on the horse, but I got the saddle on mine. You'd look at me like, what is wrong with that guy? Nobody rides a horse and puts the saddle on themselves. We put the saddle on the horse, and then we get in the saddle. Casting your care upon the Lord Jesus, respectfully, is like putting the saddle on the horse before you ride it. What are you carrying? What's in your backpack today? Are you, did you come in with a heavy backpack? Or is it nice and light? Because you've cast it, cast it, cast your care upon the Lord. Do we try to carry him ourselves? Do we cast him on him? The hymn writer said it this way. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing. All your anxiety, leave it there. No other friend so swift to help you. No other friend so quick to hear. No other place to leave your burden. No other one to hear your prayer. Come then at once, delay no longer. Heed his entreaty kind and sweet. You need not fear a disappointment. You shall find peace at the mercy seat. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Cast your care upon him because he careth for you. Let's go ahead and have our invitation time. Every head bowed and eye closed. It may be this morning that you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your personal Savior and you're, you're weighed down with a burden of guilt burden of sin, and it may be this morning that you need to get that burden lifted. And I would encourage you, in just a minute we're going to stand and have a a hymn of invitation, and I would encourage you, if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'd encourage you to make your way down front. I'll meet you down here. We'll have somebody take a Bible and show you from God's Word exactly how you can have that burden lifted today. So if, if, if you're here and you don't know Christ, um, don't, don't leave without getting that taken care of. Um, just get that settled. Now for Christians, uh, this was mostly for us this morning. Uh, if you're carrying something today that you haven't yet cast, maybe you want to use this invitation time as a way to come down to the altar and simply cast your care upon Him. Of course, you can do that from your seat and that's fine too. But listen, if you came in there this morning and, and there's something you're holding on to um, that's a, a care and anxiety that's creating struggles and challenges in your life, don't, don't leave carrying that. I mean, just cast it on Him. He cares for you. Uh, he will give you grace. He'll give you peace. He'll give you a changed countenance. He'll give you a new perspective. But we have to cast. That's what He requests. He tells us to cast our care upon him. So uh, whatever may be in uh, the Lord has spoken to you about, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity, not long, but we'll give you an opportunity to respond. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the truths that we get from it. And Lord, the simple truth this morning of humbling ourselves and casting our care upon you because you care for us. Lord, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you that it's not just salvation, uh, but Lord, you're with us every day, every step of the way. And you really do uh, desire our fellowship and relationship. So I pray for uh, someone here this morning that may not know Jesus as their Savior. I ask that you would prick their heart, that they would uh, humble themselves, set their pride aside, and that they would today get that settled where they know for sure they're on the way to heaven. 
And then, Lord, for believers here, many of them across uh, the room today uh, that are carrying burdens. They're just, Lord, life is tough. There's struggles, there's challenges. There are things that, that just always seem to come about. And, Lord, we, we know that life is that way. But I pray this morning that they would cast those upon you. Pray that we'd trust you. Lord, we trust you for our salvation. Surely we can trust you with the challenges that we face. Help us to cast upon you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand.